take your songbook to page 145 and stand with us. 145, oh, come, all ye faithful. Good song, good song. I like that song. hands and we're glad you're here. Uh, Brother Elder is in the house. Shake hands with the preacher. Brittany's in the house. Uh, uh, Nikki's in the house. Let's shake hands with our visitors, all right? Come on, you choir. Welcome, everybody, to the house of the Lord tonight. We're delighted to be back on a Sunday night. What powerful, powerful preaching the Lord allowed us to hear this morning. We're looking forward to hearing the man of God again tonight in just a little bit. The Lord willing, all right? I want to welcome Brother Elder. God bless you, Brother Elder. And I'm saying maybe a grandson. Is that a grand? Nephew, all right. And you're babysitting all by yourself. Let's have prayer for Brother Elder. God bless you. And pray for Josh Spencer. After the service, we're excommunicating one of his fingers. Somebody say amen. <laughs> All you men know what that's about. All right, this is the youth choir. Excommunicate. That's a dumb word, ain't it? We're cutting it off. You know, that, that, I thought it sounded a little bit more grammatically kind, all right? We're glad you're here. Let's say amen to this youth choir, all right?
was amazing. I heard of his wonderful peace. I heard that his love lifted sinners out of their wretched misery. But I didn't know this redeemer. I was so lost in hell. Yeah. 
Isn't that great? I mean, the half has not been told. Amen. That's exactly right. Amen. I, I tell you, you know what I think we are? We're spoiled, friend. Is the word flounder? We're floundered. I mean, God's been so good to us. God has been so good to us. I, I like these songs, and I like the fact that we can go to meeting. Amen. I love to go to church, amen, and feel liberty and feel freedom from the Lord. So thank God for the privilege to be able to get involved in the worship service. I want to quickly tell you now, Wednesday night, we'll be here at 7 o'clock. We'd love to have you. We didn't announce this this morning. Thursday evening, Miracle Hill Ministries, uh, three cases of Bibles they'll be taking, another love offering given by somebody else to help the ministry over there. What a, what a blessing. What an outreach. They started that, and it just seems like the Lord just blessed and blessed, and Appreciate Brother Rick, Brother Josh, some of these men. If you'd like to go, you're a man or a young man or even a teenager, if you'd like to go and, and just be a blessing to a group of men that, uh, I don't know what how you say it, just they just need encouragement, amen. They need, I tell you what they need, they need love, amen. They need love. And so that's why we go. So if you'd like to get free Thursday evening, you're more than welcome to go. And if you have any questions about where it is and what time, all that's in the bulletin, I believe. And if you do still have questions, ask Brother Ivester, Brother Josh, They'll help you with those things, all right? Next Sunday, 20 minutes before church service, which will be at about 9.30, 9, let's just say 9.30. They're going to begin taking pictures. We'll have a Christmas backdrop right back here. It don't cost you anything at all. Nobody's, nobody's having to pay for anything. And Miss Desiree set this up, and I think it's going to be pretty neat myself. And so uh, Christmas pictures, everybody's going to be dressed up. Then they'll be taking pictures after the service. I know you got places to go, but... We won't have service that night. Service will be 10 a.m. that morning. So come early to get some pictures or stay after and get pictures. And it won't cost you anything. They'll email them to you. You have a beautiful family photo with a Christmas backdrop. All right? That'll be great. Let's have the ushers come on in. We'll get the regular tithe and the regular offering. Brother Elder, can you? You can bring the baby. Bring the baby. That's all right. We're, we're for it. We're for it. I, I love this man. He pastors Silica Springs Baptist Church and helps us on our, on our field trips and drives the buses and just does things at chapel. We appreciate Brother Billy Elder. Brother Elder, you have a seat. God bless your little baby there. Little nephew, that's pretty neat. He's a braver man than I am, I tell you what. I, I wouldn't ever attempt it. But anyway, he's going to pray for us. You give your tithes, you give your offers. If you have anything for Brother Cooper, bring it to me personally, and I promise you I'm giving it to Brother Trey. I've already given two offerings to Brother Trey. If you have something else to give, uh, don't drop it in this. Put it in an envelope or bring it to me. Or just bring it somebody to get it to Brother Trey, okay? God bless you while the ushers serve you. Go right ahead. Mathis, could you come pray with us, Brother Mathis? Please, sir, Brother Mathis. And well, I'll tell you what, I'll get you in a little bit. I got Brother Elder. Thank you for being faithful to give. Brother Elder, if you'll come pray with us, and we're going to have our sister sing one, all right? Preacher, God bless you. Good to have you tonight. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're so thankful to be able to come to you, God, at this time to be able to celebrate the birth of your son, God, to be in the house of God tonight, and Lord, just sing your praises, and God, give back a portion of that which you've given to us materially. God, I pray that you just bless this, bless the giver. God, I pray that you'd be with the service tonight. God, I pray that your spirit would fall heavy upon us tonight, and God, I want to thank you in advance for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you very much, preacher. God bless your heart. Had their Christmas program and everything this morning is why he's able to be with us here tonight. All right, Miss Sarah, come right on. Miss Sarah's going to sing one. Then we'll have the Owens family. And then the Lord willing, the Lord willing, we'll get to the preaching. All right. Amen. It's beautiful. Everybody's listening. Brother Nathan there, his mouth is open like. <laughs> Ernest T. Bass's brothers and all that crowd. But I'm not making fun of it. I think it's pretty neat. Great, great talent. Amen. All right. This is Brother Jimmy Owens. And this is, this, this is, that, that was like, um, that was like California. And this is Calpens right here. All right. He'll, he'll, I mean, hillbillies that can sing. And I, I, listen, I like it all. Amen. I'm serious. I like it all. 
and I appreciate it all, every bit of it. She's not the man, but she's going to have a child. Her name is Mary. She's a virgin from down in Nazareth, now loose and close. She's going to marry me. a man named Joseph, but the baby's father is the Holy Ghost. years old this week serving the Lord isn't that good yeah. serving the Lord staying in church staying with the old time way listen to this staying with what his mom and daddy put in him amen that's what means a lot friends stay with what your mom and daddy put in you all right now this preacher is going to preach and we're going to let him have all the time he needs and then preacher if you will turn it back over and move we got some folks that want to join the church tonight which is always a great blessing so some of you men don't let me forget we'll have a our opening, our closing, and open the doors of the church, all right? This is Evangelist Justin Cooper. Give me undivided attention, all right? All right, take your Bible. Go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter number 11 tonight, please. Book of Acts and then chapter number 11. It has been good to be in church on this Sunday night, hasn't it? You know what I like? I like when I can say that and I don't have to lie. I say it every, I say it every week. I always do. I always say it's been good to be in church. Sometimes I just lie about it, but it's been good to be here today, and I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed all the singing and the spirit, too, and the liberty that's here, and uh, the good crowd this morning. You think about it, in spite of the sickness and in spite of the weather, and uh, you know how Baptist people, we don't sprinkle, so when it rains, we, sh we try to stay inside. So, But in spite of the weather and in spite of the sickness and in spite of Christmas and the craziness that goes around that, we had a good crowd this morning. And uh, really, it's not a bad crowd tonight, considering all those things involved there. And thank God for that. Let's not take it for granted. And uh, God's doing something here and wants to do great things here. And I'm excited about it. Hope you had a great afternoon. Hope you got some rest. And uh, looking forward to what God has for us tonight. Uh, preacher, thank you for allowing me to preach. I don't take that for granted. And I know it's, uh, it's hard not to preach. And I appreciate you letting me stand in the pulpit and preach here. And uh, thank you for that. Acts chapter number 11, it's good to have visitors here, my barber's here tonight, and uh, she said if I didn't recognize her publicly, she'd never come back, so Miss Clary, thank you for coming, she cuts my hair and Johnny's hair, she shampoos for the Todd's hair, um, <laughs> me and Johnny don't do that kind of stuff, but he does all the time, this is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my life, Acts chapter 11, and he can tell you all about it if you're interested. 
Last time I checked, anyway, yeah, Acts chapter number 11, Acts chapter number 11, and we're going to be again reading in verse number 19, and uh, we'll read down through verse number 26 tonight, and a little different kind of message than this morning, and uh, to be honest with you, I don't even know, usually when I, I preach, I really get going and get, I might not, I want you to actually hear what I'm going to say, and sometimes... Sometimes I'm afraid we, we get we get hung up on on the style and the and the tempo and and we don't actually hear what's being said. And uh, I'm for all that more than anybody else. Trust me, I am. Uh, in fact, I'm trying to get you to do it half the time. But uh, I'm for it. But I also want us to hear. And I'm praying God will use the message tonight. And the reason I say that is God has really convicted me and challenged me with this thought. So look with me here, Acts chapter 11 and verse number 19. Here's what the Bible says. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phinehas and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And by the way, that makes all the difference in the world. If we don't have that, then we don't have what we need. But if we have that, we can get the job done. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. I want to draw your attention to really the one verse biography, or you could say the one verse testimony of a man named Barnabas. What I like about this is there's many things I cannot be, but by the grace of God, I could be all of these things. And I think I ought to be, and I think you ought to be as well. And I want you to see what it said in verse number 24 about Barnabas. The Bible said he was a good man. It just speaks of his character. He was a man that uh, lived right and did right, a kind man, a Christian man, a good man. Watch this. He was full, the Bible said, of the Holy Ghost and of faith. Those two things are inseparable. If you have great faith, you're spirit-filled. And if you're spirit-filled, you're going to have great faith. Faith and fear will not cohabit, uh, inhabit a heart. And if you're surrounded and overcome with fear tonight, then you probably need to confess that sin and ask God to feel with the Spirit. We're supposed to be people of faith, not people of fear. But the result of this man having Christian character, being filled with the Holy Ghost, and having faith is this. Much people was added under the Lord. The natural result of a man or a woman that is simply a Christian who is filled with God and living by faith is fruit. And that fruit is in the form of people being added to the Lord. Andrew Murray said this, there's only two kinds of Christians, soul winners and backsliders. Soul winning is not a gift, and it is not a calling. It is the basic obligation and duty of every born-again person. You can be the greatest singer in this church, but if you're not a soul winner, you're not pleasing God. I can be the greatest preacher that ever preached, or he could be, or anybody, but if we're also not personal soul winners, we're not pleasing God. We can pray with great fervor and give great, great amounts in the offering, but if we're not every day seeking to win the lost, then we're not really pleasing God. D.O. Moody preached to millions of people. And folks got born again. D.O. Moody preached, and a man named F.B. Meyer got saved. F.B. Meyer went and preached at a place called Furman University, and a young preacher boy that had backslidden and was getting a job in the secular world, got under conviction, surrendered his life to the ministry, and he was known as R.G. Lee. F.B. Meyer went to another place and preached, and another young preacher surrendered his life to God named J. Wilbur Chapman. J. Wilbur Chapman went and preached the gospel at a rescue mission in Chicago, and there was a young baseball player there, and his name was Billy Sunday. 
And Billy Sunday got saved, and then over a million souls are won to Christ through his ministry, Billy Sunday. All of that, though, is traced back to a man named Edward Kimball, who was a Sunday school teacher. That chased after a young man in his teenage years named Dwight Moody, chased him through the shoe store where he worked all the way to the home where he was staying. D.L. Moody slid under the bed to try to hide and Edward Kimball grabbed him by the legs and pulled him out and witnessed to him and led him to Christ and got him born again. Just a young man in that city that got saved and because of that, millions upon millions of souls made professions of faith in Christ, walked the sawdust trail and got born again. The Word of God is supposed to be a lamp for us. What that means is it uncovers things. It's a, uh, it's a hammer. That means it breaks things apart. It's a sword. That means it pierces. It's food. It will strengthen us. And tonight I'm praying the Word of God will do all of that for my life and yours as well. I thought about this. We are entering into a new year. In just the next couple of weeks, we're going to turn the calendar page on 2023 and walk into 2024. Here's my question. What do you want from God in a new year? What are your goals? What are your vision or what are your dreams? What is it you want God to do? Do you have a goal sheet? You're not going to be a success if you don't have goals. Do you have a goal for your family? What do you want to see happen in your family? Do you have a goal for your business? Do you have a goal for your personal walk with God? Do you have a goal for your marriage? I want to ask you this. Do you have goals or things you'd like to see God do in this church. On Friday, I spent basically the whole day on Friday walking around on this property. And I just lived right next door, so it's not hard to do, but I just walked around and had a blower on my back, blowing leaves and just wasting time, really is what I was doing, because I'm home and don't know what to do with myself. Started walking around the property and uh, looked at the school building and all the room that's in that building. A lot of room in there. Big gymnasium in there. There's a bus garage out there with buses sitting in it. Nice one, too. And then I walked around this and saw the parking spots. You know how many parking spots there are here? There's a lot of parking spots on this parking lot. And then I walked through the church and counted the classrooms that run up and down this way. I tell you exactly how many there are on either side. And then I began to look at the number of people that live within a 30-mile radius of our church. Did you understand what God could do? with what he's already blessed us with and the people he's brought within reach of this place, if every Christian would just add one person, if we would just multiply ourselves by one between now and 2025, I mean, our church would be running almost 800 people in a year if every person who's supposed to be a member grew by one, just by one. What I have up here, just then I'm going to get to the message in a minute. I was preaching the last time I got to preach with, with Brother Sammy Allen. And he and I were together, and, and, and he had the testimony that was a not, not a true testimony, but he had a testimony that he was against gospel tracts. And, uh, and, and people were getting on and said, well, he, he's in you know, lordship, salvation. He don't believe in easy believism, and I don't believe in that either. Say amen right there. Somebody has to know they're lost before they ever get saved. I'm not trying to sell them a vacuum cleaner, amen, that's not what we're doing, but I do believe it's easy to get saved, is that everybody understand? So he gave me one of the gospel tracts that he wrote, by the way, he said the thing about gospel tracts is they'll track you down, and he said, and he, he gave me, he said, this is my last little red soul winner's new testament, and I was like, man, I'm humble, he's going to give me a soul winner's new testament, so this is the last one I've got, he said, I sell these $40, I said, man, he's going to give me that. I'm able to tell my, my son, I said, man, Sammy Allen gave me his last soul in his New Testament. And I was already thinking about how I was going to tweet it. You know what I mean? I was just already ready to tell. And he looked at me and said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give it to you for 20 bucks. <laughs> Sold it to me. He said, but it goes to the camp. And I said, all right. So I bought it from him. This Bible right here was given to me. This belonged to a man named Carl Hatch. I don't know if you've ever heard of Carl Hatch here before or not. Carl Hatch was a soul winner. Carl Hatch would go through the airport and slide gospel tracks under the stalls in the men's room and just say, hey, while you're in there, here's something for you to read. He was in the, in the airport one time, and he was doing that. I think it was in Atlanta airport. And he was just throwing gospel tracks under the stalls and said, here's something for you to read. And all of a sudden, he threw one under and heard a voice said, Carl, was that you? And he said, who is that? He said, it's John R. Rice. And John R. Rice was in the bathroom stall, and Carl Hatch tried to lead him to the Lord. 
I got saved reading this right here, this very one. This is what I got saved reading right here. My father-in-law gave me this. I went to church with him on Sunday morning and uh, went for a date. And he could tell I was under conviction. I didn't walk the aisle and get saved because I was too pr full of pride, worried about what people would think. Yeah, yeah, and so he yeah. said, when you get back to college, he said, read that, read that pamphlet I gave you and, and tell me what you think about it. And really, it's not even a salvation pamphlet. It's a pamphlet on soul winning and having bloody hands if you don't win souls. Old. And I began to read that. In fact, I got it highlighted in here on the page where, where it hit me. But there's a statement in here that says the fruit of a Christian is another Christian. And it said a Christian who doesn't have a burden for lost people probably is not a Christian. And I began to think I never gave a rip if anybody else got saved or not. I could have cared less if you went to hell. And the Holy Ghost of God convicted me and said that's because you're not saved. And in my college apartment I buried my face in the carpet and cried out to Jesus to save me. And he did. This is our heritage by the way. This is, this is, this is a handwritten outline that was given me by Dr. Tom Malone. Dr. Malone in Pontiac, Michigan. And I looked at it before I came, and the title of this message was Belonging to Jesus. And his first point was this. Many do not belong to Jesus, and they know it. But the second was this. Many don't belong to Jesus, and they don't know it. And the third point on the back is many don't belong to Jesus, and they won't know it. And how are they going to know if you and I don't tell them? At the very heart of God is the salvation of sinners. The salvation of sinners is the reason you have a Bible. The salvation of sinners is the reason that Jesus left heaven and came down to earth. The salvation of sinners is the reason why we have a virgin birth. The salvation of sinners is the purpose behind every miracle Jesus did, every prayer Jesus prayed, and every word that Jesus ever spoke. When Jesus entered into a city, he didn't go for recreation, he didn't go for vacation, he didn't go to relax. He went to reach those that were dying in sin. The salvation of sinners is the reason that Jesus prayed in Gethsemane. The salvation of sinners is the reason Jesus went to a cross on Calvary. Every lashing of the whip, every time he was smacked across the face, every moment of piercing with the thorns and the piercing of the nails, every scourge, every bit of spit, every bead of blood that ran down his face was for the salvation of sinners. In 1 Timothy 1, the Bible said, For this is the faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And there's no question about it. If Jesus was here tonight, Jesus would be busy about the same thing he was busy about when he walked the streets of this world 2,000 years ago. He'd be trying to seek and save that which is lost. Now, there's a lot of things tonight that I cannot do that Jesus did. I cannot walk on water like Jesus did. I cannot feed multitudes with little like Jesus did. I can't turn water into wine like Jesus did. I can't raise the dead, and I try to do it every day I get up to preach. I cannot raise the dead like Jesus did. I can't open blinded eyes and heal lepers like Jesus did. But hallelujah, there is one thing that I can do that Jesus did and it's the nearest thing to his heart and that is to give the gospel to those one heartbeat from eternity and tell them how to miss hell and go to heaven. I'll say it again. There's only two kinds of Christians. There are those who are soul winners and those who are backslidden. Now think tonight the blessing that it is to consider that God would use someone like me and use someone like you to be a daysman, an ambassador, a witness and stand in the gap and to point sinners heavenward. I mean, it's an amazing thing that God would take an old sinner like me and save me by the grace of God and give me a tongue to speak and a mind to think and energy to go to share the gospel with a lost and dying world. George W. Truett said, the winning of a sinner is the highest achievement possible to mankind. It's amazing to consider what Jesus loves the most and then consider what churches waste the most time doing. It's amazing how much time we'll spend toiling over that which is unnecessary and how little effort we give to that which is most important. There's committees on decorating the church. 
There's boards on how to operate the program. We make sure we have fellowships for every age group. But where's the emphasis on fishing for men? I'm afraid today that soul winning is a term that's gone the way of the dinosaur. It's sort of like Sunday school in an emergent church. You don't even hear the term mentioned any longer. It's been shelved and exchanged for little coffee fellowships. And I'll invite them to church. I'm talking about confrontational evangelism, telling somebody if they don't get saved, they'll bust hell wide open. Why would you have three services a week if you're not going to go soul winning? There won't be enough people to preach to anyways. Why sing those old hymns if you're not going to go soul winning? There's too much doctrine and conviction in them to sing if you're not going to practice. Why emphasize standards and holiness if you're not going to go soul winning? It's better to just please yourself and make people happy anyhow. I wrote this down the other day. I was well, spoken in my phone. I was driving down the road. We are past the time in America where we can just put up a steeple, light up a church sign, open our doors, and expect folk to fill the pew. We are living in a post-Christian pagan country. We are not living in a Christian nation. There are churches on every corner, but they're just as dead as the graveyard down the road. And if we're going to have a church for the next decade, it's going to take more than just showing up. Singing some songs, shouting on the inside, and then going to our house being an incognito, undercover Christian. Somebody's going to have to get out in the highways and hedges and tell folks that Jesus saves. Historically, Baptist churches have been known for an emphasis on reaching the lost. And now we blame dwindling attendance on the changing of trend, but really it's apathy and laziness among God's people. It used to be, and I preached in some churches, I preached in a church in Ohio that used to run 700 people, now they run 70 people. And here's the thing, I was talking to some men, and, and probably Brother Spencer about your age, and you're not old, I know that, but your age, a different generation than mine. And they said, I tell you what, Brother Cooper, when I was your age, my family had a bus route. We're a young family. I'm talking about they were in their 20s. Now, I know we got multiplication today and everything, but they had a bus route back then. Yeah, yeah. Everybody all right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And he said, here's what we'd do. We'd get up in the morning on Saturday, work all day, Monday to Friday. Our Saturday was given to soul winning. And we'd get up and have our soul winning meeting at 8 or 9 in the morning. And then we'd work our bus route and be out there until about 2 in the afternoon. And then I'd go back to the church for men's prayers Saturday night. And say, then we'd pack up a bus with 100 people and drive them to church on Sunday morning. He said, but now I can't get anybody young to do that. They're so thinly stretched with things that aren't going to matter in a million years. I'm talking about, think about all the things that we emphasize. All the things that we put the most effort into that don't even make a blip on the radar of heaven. Churches today are trying everything imaginable to hide the fact they don't have God. They're painting it up, putting on a show, lights, camera, action. Because they don't have the power of the Holy Ghost. And they don't have folks who are out there fishing for men and bringing sinners in. One man said, if you want to keep trouble out of your church, then keep the waters troubled in your church. Amen. There's a lot of things we can do that are okay. But there's one thing that we're supposed to do, and that's to win the lost. In Mark 16, 15, the Bible said, go you know the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Bible said, if you'll go out and preach the gospel to anything that's breathing air, that's the right candidate to hear the gospel. And I'll say it again, soul winning is not a command, rather a gift or a talent. It is a command. It is the initial work of every child of God. I'm afraid sometimes people will add a position or a title to their Christian life and then abandon soul winning. What I mean by that is this, they were more fervent to witness to folk before they got the position. And then all of a sudden, now they're a Sunday school school teacher and they can't soul win and now they're a deacon and they can't go soul win them and now they're a pastor and they won't soul win now they're an evangelist and they don't go soul winning now they're a mom and they can't soul win now they're a daddy and they can't soul you don't subtract the most important thing from your christianity you add those other things to the most important thing here's what i'm saying is you ought to be a soul winner if you're a sunday school teacher you ought to be a soul winner if you're a deacon you ought to be a soul winner to be able to sit in that choir you ought to be a soul winner if you're going to shout during the preaching, you got to be a soul winner to stand behind the pulpit. If you're saved, you've been given life and breath and time to tell somebody else how to get saved. It would embarrass me, and I know it would embarrass you, if we had to stand up today and tell the last time that we won someone to Christ. Wait a minute now. 
The Holy Ghost does the winning. So maybe it's been a while, but you've been going. That's fine. But what about this? When's the last time you cared enough to even go? I read that illustration about a little fella. He is peculiar. He's a rabid soul winner. He didn't ever you know, worry about what people thought. He just witnessed wherever he went. And he walked into this fancy hotel in New York City, and there's a woman sitting there all dressed up in her pomp and circumstance. I mean, just dressed to the nines. He walked right up to her and said, you know, you're a sinner. If you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell. And she started to weep and said, you know what? You're right. I'm not saved, and I, I need to get saved. I don't want to go to hell. And she got saved right there in the lobby, and that little soul winner went his way. That woman's husband came down and said, what's wrong with you? She he said, uh, this little man came to me and talked to me about his about my soul. And he said, well, if I'd have been here, I'd have told that sucker to mind his business. She said, if you'd have been here, you'd have known he was minding his business. And I want you to know that is your business, and that is my business. I don't care if you sell insurance. I don't care if you work at a shop somewhere. I don't care if you're a school teacher. I don't care what you do. Uh, there's a mission field right outside the doors of this church, and you and I have been commissioned to give the gospel to every breathing preacher I want to ask you a question would this church live if it was dependent on you bringing people into it I'll tell you how it was in California where I associate pastor out there and it was it, it's different I know it's different but folks will complain that I just don't have a lot of folks in my class my Sunday school class I don't have a lot of people in my Sunday school class wait a minute it's not up to me to put people in your class. Christian school teachers, well, there's just not very many kids in our age, in, in, in the kindergarten this year. Well, it's not up to me to put kindergartners in your class. It's up to that teacher to put kindergartners in her class. Everybody all right? They say, well, I don't know. I, 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 teach, I teach the young adults, and we don't have a lot of young adults. Well, then what in the world are you doing all week long? Well, I, I work with the youth, and our youth group sure is struggling. Well, when's the last time you called time out to go win some youth to Christ? You know, everything people want in the church is birthed by soul winning. You know what they want in the church? They want ball, ball games. Isn't that what they want? Seriously, that's what they want. And that's fine. I want it too. They want that. They want fellowships. They want stuff for the kids. They want people. Well, all that is birthed by getting folks in one at a time. Barnabas is a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And here's his testimony. Much people was added unto the Lord. Do you ever drive around this area? Now, you might have to put, you might have to, you might have to just vote me out if you can't put up with this. I'm just going to be honest with you. I drive around this area and just sit there and watch and see and count houses on streets and trailers down little roads and look around this area. You know, within 30 miles of this church right here, there's over a million people that live within 30 to 40 miles of this church. Do you know Spartanburg is growing at a faster rate than Greenville if you look at the percentages right now? Do you understand that? And God has planted a church right by the interstate. I got a text message yesterday from somebody from another state that texted me and said, Hey, I'm driving up 85, just saw the big red cross. Want to let you know we just went by your place uh, praying for Sunday services. You think God planted a lighthouse on the side of a major road like that just to sit here and dwindle on the vine and dry up and die out? I don't think so. There was a church up in Charlotte, Northside Baptist Church, where Jack Hudson was the pastor. My grandpa surrendered to preach there in an old Southwide meeting. You go there today, it's not what it used to be. There's got to be a place in this area that God will raise up to fill in the gap and make up the hedge. And i tell you what I want. I'd rather die or go somewhere else than to be a part of a place that is complacent and ready just to sit back and enjoy. Another generation built this. And here's what I'm afraid of. A sacrificial generation gives us buildings like this and gives us property and then we get lazy and sit back and say, well, let's just enjoy it. But what about the next generation? Somebody's going to throw out the lifeline. Somebody's going to rescue the perishing. Somebody has to care for the dying. The drunk needs a soul winner. The dope addict needs a soul winner. The broken home needs a soul winner. The woman on the street needs a soul winner. The religious crowd needs a soul winner. They're everywhere out there. When's the last time? When's the last time? When's the last time you took a gospel track? And just gave it to somebody. I mean, just what you don't even, you say, well, I don't like talking to people. Then don't talk to them. 
do a hit and run. Just run up to him, hand it to him, and leave. I'll be honest with you. Now listen, I'm not the greatest soul winner, but I'm good at giving tracks out. I don't get gas without putting a track out. I roll that thing up and shove it right into the handle of the gas pump when I put it back in the machine. That next person can't get gas unless they at least touch the track. And if I can't get it to stick in there, then I put it there on the I put it there on the screen where they have to read four thousand dollars for four gallons of gas, you know. But I make sure they see it. I remember the first soul I led to Christ. I was I was I was uh, in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Uh, I'd surrendered to preach up that way, and uh, we went out to a, f- a prison facility in uh, in uh, I think it was Clinton, North Carolina. And and I remember I, I was in there. I didn't know what to do. Man, I was scared to death. And a bunch of young fellas in there looking at me like they hated me. And I thought, what what, what why would why am I even here? Scared me to death. And I looked at those fellas and I said, you know what? I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to junk the sermon and just be honest with them. And I said, fellas, I don't even want to be here. It is Saturday. I was a school teacher back then. You want to drive a man to the ministry? Put him in a school for a, for a little while. He'll, he'll quit and go to the ministry. It's easier in the ministry. Anyway, I, 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 I said, I don't want to be home. It's my only day off. I want to be at home. I said, but I'll tell you this. I said, you might not have a parent that loved you. You might not have any friends that love you. And I'll be honest with you, I don't even think I love you. But there's a God in heaven that loves you. And I watched tears begin to roll down the face of those boys in there for different things. And this big old fella in there looked like he'd be a WWE wrestler. Came walking down the front. I thought he's going to kill me. He said, I need to get saved. I led that fellow to Christ right there. And then 18 others of them came and said, we want to get saved too. And I said, well, that's between you and God, but here's how you get saved. And man, I called my mom after that and said, Mama, you'll never believe it. She said, what'd you do? I said, no, it's good. I said, she said, what happened? I said, man, I went to a juvenile detention center today, got to give the gospel. I said, 18 young men made professions of faith. She said, what in the world? She about passed out on the phone. But I'll tell you what happened to me. That changed my life. I've not been the same since. I tell you, there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. And hell is hot and heaven is sweet and eternity is moving. It's closer than you realize. And every person that you pass is one heartbeat from one of those two places. And you and I have been left here to tell them that Jesus what if every person in this church passed out one track a day one track per day I'm not talking about even talking to somebody what if you just give one track per day we took we, we, we took the bus, the bus kids out there they would bundle me up tracks Seven of them in a little bundle with a rubber band, and I'd hand them out to church folk and said, hey, the bus kids bundled these for you. They can't go, but you can go. And they took time out of their day to make sure you had tracks. And before folks would leave church, we were out in the lobby saying, here's your bundle. Now, we didn't check on them, make sure they passed it out, but you ought not have to do that to a Christian anyway. Uh, we just said, here's your bundle. You say, how many people came to your church? A lot. I remember the first person I led to Christ out there in California, his name was Juan. There's nobody out there named Justin, that's for sure, but anyway, Juan or something like that. He had gear shifts tattooed on his chest, had no shirt on, so I took mine off too. Just on, no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, he had, he had tattoos all over his chest. I was talking to him. I mean, he smelled like marijuana and everything else. I mean, just sitting on the... But I remember watching that boy. You can just tell when God's dealing with... And I can tell when God's not. But you can tell when God is. And man, I watched Juan bow his head there on his doorstep and receive Christ as his Savior. And it got me all stirred up. And I, I looked at my, my phone notes over there in the office before I walked over here. And I've still got it on my phone. Follow up uh, with Brother Chad on Christina and Ryan, apartment 2275, Cheyenne, apartment 22, Miguel, apartment 14, Robert, apartment 14. These are souls, Carol, apartment 13, Paul, building C, Saul, apartment number four, Vince, in building number one, Eddie, in building number four, Joel, on Green. Lee Drive, Manuel and Kevin, uh, the next street over, Precious, got saved with me and Brother Apusin, and I wrote those things down. Those are people now that will have a home in heaven, and we're not anything, but he's everything, and he told us to go. But I'll say all over this area are people in these houses and in those trailers and in those apartments in Spartanburg and going up the other way towards Charlotte that need to know that Jesus loves them. And I know this is the buckle of the Bible Belt, and they think they're saved, but they're not saved. They need to know that Jesus is real and that God is real and the gospel is great and grace is sufficient and you and I are to be here to tell them about it. 
Paul had that dream. A man of Macedonia said, come on over here. Come over here. Help us. Man, I remember going out knocking these doors, and this fella, uh, this woman named Denise, and this fellow named Rodney were shacked up together. And I remember uh, talking to them, and, and they ended up both getting saved, came and joined my Sunday school class. They, and I got to baptize them there uh, at the church, and, and they ended up having to uh, get married, get things right. I got to go to their apartment and pray, and they said, we want you to dedicate our apartment to God. And got to stand there, and I thought, man, them some broken lives that God put back together. I tell you what, I'd rather pastor a church full of people like that than a bunch of dead heads fundamentalists that think they got it all together I don't like it when I go to a church and everybody's been there for decades they've been saved so long they don't enjoy it give me some folks fresh from the field being pulled out of the fire saved with fear if you will that's the way I like to go to church oh man you got to bring somebody with you look down your pew right now and see how much space is in it and then make that your mission probably some folks in here have never won a soul to Christ I guarantee it. Because, listen, most Christians haven't. And I'm not dogging you for that. I'm just saying most Christians have never won a soul to Christ. Never gone to, a, never gone to a, a, somebody's house and knocked on a door. Never, never, never been out on a street corner somewhere. Never, never been at Walmart somewhere. Just never, never done it. You, you, maybe want, you just don't know how to do it. Well, here's what I challenge you. Get hooked up with somebody who goes and let them show you how to go. And listen, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get addicted to that. That is stronger than any kind of crack you buy out on the street. I promise you that. You lead one soul to Christ, you're going to want to do it again because there's nothing like that. I had these two fellas named Muhammad and Saeed. I wanted to Christ out there. Muhammad and Saeed were from uh, uh, Iran, Muslims. I got to see them get born again. The power of the gospel. There ain't nobody in this area that's too far gone that the gospel couldn't bring them back. I think churches are happy about COVID. I think churches like COVID. Because COVID has given us an out. Because most churches quit their soul winning meetings during COVID and never brought them back after. Most churches quit their buses during COVID and never brought them back after. A lot of churches quit their choir during COVID and never brought them back after. And now there's compromise and everything else because they're trying to keep a full building. There's a big difference in reaching people and just drawing a crowd. If you go out here tonight and hit a deer, that deer's going to grow after a few days. Yep. It's going to swell up. Yep. Right. But don't mean it's alive. Right. It's just as dead as ever. Right. It's just corrupting. But there's growth there. Right. I don't know about you, but I don't care about drawing a crowd, but I'd like to reach some people. Listen to this. If you're going to be a soul winner, number one, you need a testimony. He's a good man. It's going to be something you're going to have to live, too. Lot couldn't get his sons-in-laws out of Sodom because he hadn't lived right. I think a lot of Christians don't ever witness because they know, listen, they hadn't lived right in front of those they're about to witness to. He's a good man. Watch this. He's full of the Holy Ghost. He's empowered by the Spirit of God. The only way soul winning works is if you've got the power of God. Because it makes no sense for you and I to show up at some stranger's house, tell them they're going to go to hell, and then they agree with you. They still got fruity pebbles on their chin watching cartoons in the morning. You show up as a stranger and say, by the way, you know if you die today, you go. And they're, you know what, I, don't, I think I need that. That doesn't make any sense at all unless the power of God is involved. But the Holy Spirit of God is what takes a man. Listen, usually I found this out, and I'll close. In, the people in the church that I go to preach, the weirdest people are usually the best soul winners. No offense, Josh. But, but it holds true. But seriously, odd people. Have you ever noticed that? It seems like God uses them. And I think it's because there's no room for any kind of flesh exaltation in that. Because you can look at that individual and say, boy, there's no personality there. Uh, there's not a lot of charisma. They're kind of different. And yet that person will go out there and lead folks to Christ. I'll tell you what makes the difference. It's the power of God. And then he did this. He went and got Saul of Tarsus and said, let's do it together, Paul. Get a partner and go. I tell you what you ought to do. You have partners for the gym. And you got hunting buddies and fishing pals and shopping friends and all that stuff. When's the last time you said, hey, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go to Waffle House. 
And after that, we're going to go knock some doors. Yeah. All right. And All right. after we knock some doors, we're going to go back to Waffle House. And we're going to have a good time with it. God help us all. I'll be honest with you. We're not trying to do something for folks to say, boy, boy, look at that. Look what they're doing. But if we really love God, we're going to love the people God loves. And that's every person who's breathing air right now. It shouldn't be weird. It should be just as normal for us to see that curtain pulled back as it is to turn the lights on. It shouldn't be like once a quarter. We should see that every week. Church this size, you can't tell me there's 300 people, 400 people if it's a good day, whatever, and not one person got saved throughout the week. If I knock 100 doors a week, I should be able to at least see one person. And if they don't get saved, I'd be able to get them to come. That's right. That's worth that. That's right. That's good. So what, what do you say? What about it? If you're a Christian school teacher, you ought to be a soul winner. That should come in the job description. If you want the privilege of teaching in the Christian school, then you should set the example by being a personal soul winner. If you're a Sunday school teacher, then you should be a soul winner. Amen. In fact, if you're not one, then you shouldn't be one. For me to preach this to you, I told you God convicted me over this. I need to be a soul winner. Or I have no right to stand up and preach. If Jesus was here tonight, that's what he'd be doing. You say, where do I start? Probably in your own house. You got a lost husband or a lost wife or children who are not saved. You got grandchildren. Then branch out to your neighbors. And then just drive around and look. The sea of life is full of fish. And they're always biting if somebody will just cast out a gut. I think about what we could do and what God would do. When's the last time you led someone to Christ? How about this? When's the last time you cared enough to try to win someone to Christ? I'm going to pray. I told you it's a different thought. But there's a new year coming. How many folks, I mean, what is it? What, what are you going to do? If this church depended on me or you, that's a scary thought for me. Landon said something to me, joking with me. He's joking with me because he, he, he's, he's an idiot. But Landon was joking with me. You might not even remember this, but it, it, it bothered me, and you didn't mean it to. And you didn't bother me. What you said convicted me. I don't remember if it was during a revival meeting or not. He said, he said you've already been here in three months. Well, he ain't grown yet. And then he's joking. You remember that? I'm glad you remember. I hope God deals with you. <laughs> but God dealt with me about it. I haven't been here, honestly. I've been here like three services. Right, right. And I'm not here during the week like I want to be. No. But it convicted me still. I've been here long enough to have one person here at least. God help us all. Lord help us, Jesus. But you're here every day of the week. Right. Lord help us. And I love you, and I wouldn't say that if I didn't. We want what's best. We want, I tell you, the church be awesome. Yes. It's just awesome. When you see sinners walking out and get saved in service, yes. and you got new blood pumping into a place, yes. and the Sunday school classes, the Sunday school classes are growing, new young couples added, all that happens through soul winning. Yes. The fellowships help with that, but every fellowship is to soul win. The fall festival helps with that, but the fall festival's purpose is soul win. And everything we do ought to be aimed at that. I'm going to pray. Maybe we ought to get on the altar as a church family and ask God to give us a fresh vision for souls. Come ask God to give us a burden for somebody. Maybe right now paint their face in your mind. See that person you know is not saved. And ask God to give you that soul before maybe in the end of this year. But wouldn't it be awesome this time next year we look around and say, boy, that person was added to the Lord. That person was added to the Lord. That person was added to the Lord. Because we've got a burden to win souls. I'm going to pray. If you need to come, you come. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight. God, thank you for the opportunity to preach and speak to our church family. And God, I pray you'd help us to bind together as one body here today with one goal and one focus and one agenda. I pray we get, sure, we get hungry and sold out and serious about this thing. God, we've got it all. We've got, we've got the best choir. We've got the nicest buildings. God, I pray you'd give us a fervor for souls now. God, help us in this new year, especially, to see much fruit. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. The altar is open.